coming to tonight's member series talk entitled Trust is an Illusion, Hardware and Software Backdoors in Computer Science, which will be delivered by Kent. Um, a little bit of bio on this very interesting person out here. <laughs> Did you know that Kent is an elementary school dropout? <laughs> so, after dropping out of school at the ripe age of four <laughs> to read more books, Finishing uh, an undergraduate degree in computer science and pure mathematics, Kent is now enrolled in a master's program in computer science at UBC. Privately, he prefers to call it being paid to learn new things program. <laughs> when not engaged in computer science pro topic, he can be found reading books, talking about books, thinking about books, and playing piano. So well, welcome, Kent, and join me. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yes, my talk is, in particular, uh, it's about hardware, software, backdoors, and computer science. So let's see, what are we doing? The goal is to talk about backdoors in computer security, because this is really the relevant portion of computer science to talk about backdoors in. But before we do that, we should really talk about what computer security is because that seems useful. And then once we're done with that, we should be sort of a little bit more positive and look at some countermeasures for backdoors in computer science because, you know, we want to end this on a positive note rather than a negative note. So this may come as a surprise or maybe not as a surprise, but computer security and computer hacking, cracking, whatever it is you want to label it as, is nothing like what you see in modern media. Um, in particular, there's no you know, fancy progress bars, there's usually no um, graphical interfaces or anything. It's just, it's actually kind of boring to watch. In fact, it's extremely boring to watch because usually, most of the time when you're doing computer security related stuff, you're actually looking for things, you're actually chasing dead ends and confirming that hunches are wrong because you really want your hunches to be wrong because if your hunches are right, that means that something has gone horribly wrong and that there is a problem in what it is you're looking at. So yes, the holy grail of computer security when you're attacking a system is usually to see something along these lines, through general hosts. Which, if you have that, that means your attack has usually been successful. Um, well, unless you already had root access to begin with, but that's not terribly important. But really, fundamentally, for the purposes of this talk, it's best to think about computer security as finding and exploiting flaws in the design and implementation of programs. In particular, Programs is a little bit actually too narrow of scope. Let's broaden it out to computer systems as a whole. So com computer security is also about the deployment environment, about uh, where, sort of where a computer system is running in. Um, so as an example, well, actually, you know what? We're, let's not get into example. We're not going to focus on it in this because there's a very good reason why we don't want to focus on this. It's usually known as the PEBCAC issue. So PEBCAC is an acronym for problem exists between keyboard and chair, otherwise known as the user's fault. Programmers are good most of the time. They do their best to ensure that misconfiguration is not a problem, but you cannot account for every single last iota of user stupidity. This is something that we simply cannot do. And so I'm not even going to touch that in this talk other than this. So <laughs> what we want to talk about is design and implementation flaws in computer systems. So I'm not going to go into what a computer system is. I think we all have a pretty good idea of what consists of a computer system. What's a really interesting question to ask is what is a flaw? So there's the classic question uh, or the classic explanation, that's not a bug, that's a feature, which is something that you get a lot when dealing with um, tech support at companies when you try and call them and ask them what's wrong with their software. Um, so a flaw, the way I think about it and the way I'm sort of presenting it now, is really just when a program or when a system acts counter to how you expect it to. Now, that's not, I didn't expect this button to do that, it's, for example, the documentation says when I click on this button, it sends the document to the printer. And when you click on the button, it doesn't do anything. That is a flaw because it's not doing something 
that elsewhere is explicitly stated or really obvious that it should do something. Another better example is when you enter the correct password and username into a system and you hit log in, it does not let you log in. That would be considered a flaw because it's acting counter to what you would reasonably expect from the computer system as a whole. A really interesting question uh, that I'm going to set aside for the moment, do we really have a good way to codify expectations? Do we have a way to set in stone what we expect from a program and how we really expect programs to behave? That is a really interesting question, which again, we'll get back to in a bit. So let's take some examples of flaws that are sort of relevant in computer security, things that we, um, yeah, things in computer security that are good examples of flaws to talk about in the perspective of this talk. So the first one, cream, um, is actually sort of, that's a name that was assigned posthumously in the sense that it was really only assigned sometime in the last couple of months, despite the attack being from 2005. Um, but it's a, really, it's a really interesting attack. But fundamentally, what these attacks are is they are flaws, they're bugs, they're misco um, miscoding problems in the source code of various pieces of software that have resulted in serious security flaws. So the third and fourth one, a lot of people have probably heard about at this point because they were in um, mass media for quite a few <laughs> uh, weeks um, earlier on this year. It was a pair of very serious security flaws that allowed um, lots of very troublesome things to happen. So in the case of Heartbleed, um, the, essentially the situation was there was a bug in part of the code of um, the OpenSSL library um, which essentially allowed arbitrary information disclosure in the sense that if you, cr if you crafted a request to a computer just right, you could have it give you information that you were not supposed to have. This information was ex could potentially be extremely sensitive information. So for those of you who know uh, public key crypto, this included getting information about the private keys, including the private keys themselves. This is basically akin to breaking the entire model of trust that we use for secure web servers. So anytime you see HTTPS and the lock icon, that's um, basically saying that your uh, communication between you and that server is secure, it cannot be eavesdropped on or modified. When someone gets a hold of the private key that used by the server to do this communication, anyone can masquerade as the other side and can also intercept your communications, which is sort of defeating the point of actually having this secure wrapper around your communications in the first place. So Heartbleed was an extremely serious vulnerability in that sense. Um, and also because it had a catchy name, you know, it got into mass media a lot more quickly than, and stayed there a lot longer. Shellshock was another one um, that was pretty recent, and you have to like the name. Um, there was initially a shell called the Born shell, because the author's last name was Born. And so when the time came to write a shell that was very close to it, they called it the Born Again shell. <laughs> That's computer scientist humor for you. Um, <laughs> anyway, the last one is something that probably a lot of people have not actually heard about, um, the mask attack. This is essentially something um, for uh, Apple iOS devices um, that the basic idea of the attack is that you can, if you upload, you, you can add an application to Apple's application store, App Store, um, that when installed actually overwrites an application that's already existing on the computer. Sorry? Oop, thank you. Screensavers do become a little bit of an issue sometimes. Um, <laughs> I should disable it, but whatever. So the idea is that you can essentially overwrite an existing app with a new one if you, want, if you, if, if you craft it properly. So this new application um, can have all the same functionality of the original plus whatever else you want to have, or it can just be nothing depending on what sort of thing you want to do. But fundamentally what it lets you do is it lets you access information that the other application had stored. So if for example, you replace the email client with another email client that has whatever code you want in it, that's kind of, you know, a little bit on the annoying side. 
because that allows that, that allows the author of this replacement application to access all that application's data, grab your email, send emails as you do whatever they want, essentially. The second one, uh, CVE 2008-0166, um, is something that will be um, a lot more relevant in a little bit, so I'm going to delay talking about that one in particular. And because I don't think anyone's really interested about Cream, I'll skip it for now, but if anyone is interested, um, ask me a question or talk to me afterwards. I'll give you all the gory details if you like. So a really interesting question to ask is, can we really categorize these sorts of flaws? And can we sort of put them into buckets so that we can try to deal with them in categories as opposed to all attacks at once, which is a huge scope to try and deal with? So the answer is yes. Um, we can uh, we can sort of classify them. We can classify them as denial of service attacks or denial of service flaws, which are, you can think of them as if you're running a computer that has a web server running on it, and then there's some flaw in that web server that lets someone crash the computer. That's a denial of service attack because what they're doing is they're forcing your service, your web server, um, your web page, to no longer be available. Hence, denying the service from existing. Information disclosure is similar to Heartbleed in the sense that it's a way of, it's a flaw that allows a user of a system to access information they are not supposed to be able to access. Um, arbitrary code execution is extremely scary. Uh, for example, in the web server situation, that's when you can access a particular web page that by accessing that lets you do whatever you want on the target system, such as deleting all data or copying all data or whatever you want. That is something that we're not really going to be talking about too much. Privilege escalation is a more interesting one. Uh, privilege escalation is in a sense where, for example, let's say you're working on um, you're, you're working on a system. Um, let's say it's a it's a computer um, that's not owned by you, it's instead owned by some infrastructure. Let's say it's one of the UBC public library computers. When you log on to one of those computers, you have limited access for what you can and cannot do. There are particular files that you can't modify. Um, there are particular things you cannot do because you are not an administrative user on that computer. You're just a regular user. A privilege escalation flaw would be something that lets you change your privileges from an ordinary user into an administrator user. So this is sort of like an information disclosure attack in the sense that you're accessing information you're not supposed to, but the flaw is not that you're getting access to information that you're not supposed to have, it's that you are able to bypass the access control in the sense that you are allowed to change who you are, which is not really a good thing. So the question to ask once we have this information is, well, what's a backdoor exactly and precisely? But before I get on to that, I have said a lot in the last 10 minutes. So is there anything I can try to clear up? Any confusions that exist? Anything that I can say? That... Okay, um, so that's something I should uh, clarify, um, I guess. So the idea of a computer system is it's essentially, um, you can think of it as hard, um, a piece of hardware and a piece of software that work together to perform some task. Um, it's a, a little more complicated than that because, for example, you can have a piece of hardware, which is an ordinary, let's say this laptop, you can have a piece of software, which is the operating system, such as Windows, running on the laptop, and then you can have another piece of software, um, which is, for example, a word processor, and you can have a fourth piece of software, or third piece of software, sorry, that, like a web browser or something, that as a whole is a computer system, so it's the hardware and the software that's running together to try and uh, perform a task. Does that help a little bit? Is there anything else that I can address? So in your world, human beings really are outside the system. That's the acronym of the outside thing that you know. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Humans, um, for the most part, are um, the, the, essentially they're the things that are submitting requests into the system that are, it's what you're interacting with but fundamentally, as you say, that means you're, they're not in the system itself. So all of this post-human, post-modern cybernetic stuff about how human beings are their um, extensions are no longer really distinct from one another. It doesn't cut it with computer scientists. Not really, no. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. The, and another point is that um, there, just because 
um, there's nothing that says that you have to be interacting with a, a person or a human. There can be security flaws that will only, for example, reveal themselves when you're interacting with another computer. This is, this is a, a valid thing to do. For example, um, you can have things called timing attacks, where the timing, if you get the timing exactly right, and for example, two requests into a system, so clicking a mouse button at precisely the right interval, for example, can actually cause different behavior to happen. So in, some, in, a, lot of, in a lot of cases, we're actually talking about systems that interact only with other systems. Those other systems, in turn, might interact with, computer, with humans, and that's how the requests actually come in. But yes, it, it, we're talking about mostly interactions between different things, be they humans or computer systems. Is there anything else? Uh, you're talking about attacks on individual PCs, not talking about attacks on the university server, for example. Yes. Just yeah. individual. M mostly just individual computer systems. Yeah, uh, looking at attacks on entire network systems at the same time is a fascinating problem, but that's not something that we can really address in a short, <laughs> relatively short talk. Okay, um, in that case, let's get on to what exactly a backdoor is. So a backdoor um, is something I'm going to basically define as a deliberately inserted security flaw. When you have a flaw like these ones that I mentioned, Hartley, Shellshock, whatever, um, if you have a flaw like that and it's been inserted on purpose, that is a backdoor. Well, because we're dealing with security, it's, you know, security is generally considered to be a good thing, so why would you actually insert a backdoor in the first place? And the answer is pretty much that anytime you would want to crack computer security, that's a reason why you might want to insert a backdoor. So, very, depending on who you ask, you'll get different answers. If you're asking, for example, a government agency, you'll say, okay, well, we need it for, well, national security, if you're in the United States, or anti-foreign intelligence, or for foreign intelligence. There's a whole laundry list of reasons if you're a government agency. Um, if you are, let's say, in corporate intelligence, then, you know, um, cracking computer security on uh, your competitors to see what they're up to, or whatever, that's potentially useful information. Um, most of the reasons why you would want to crack computer security are questionably ethical, shall we say. Um, it, okay, fine. It depends on what ethical system you're working under. But f let's say questionably legal uh, and leave it at that. I do not agree with the practice of inserting backdoors. Um, but anyways, so how often do these things actually turn up? And the answer is it's hard to answer because backdoors almost by definition are very hard to find. A piece of software that has a backdoor in it that's obviously a backdoor is probably not going to get used. If you know it's insecure, you're not going to use it. So by definition, backdoors almost have to hide themselves perfectly. So it's, it's a little bit hard to answer the question of how often these things show up. But they do show up relatively often. Um, I'll, I have a couple of examples that I'm going to uh, walk through. And a really sort of amusing side anecdote is that it's really um, one way you can actually protect yourself from backdoors in some sense, protect yourself, is by using software that's not popular. Because it has to be a large enough market share, a large enough amount of people using a piece of software before it's worth inserting a backdoor into it. I find that amusing, at least. So, how serious is a backdoor? So I've just said that you know you have these security flaws and whatever. How, how how serious are these things in the first place? So an excellent place to start is sort of the traditional one in computer science. Um, it's called the trusting trust backdoor because it was sort of first detailed in a paper by uh, Ken Thompson um, entitled "Reflections on Trusting Trust." Um, it's a classic paper. It's not designed for computer science audiences. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, you should definitely go and read it. It's short. It's like two pages. Um, but anyways, let's talk about it for a bit. So the idea is um, what we have is we have a, a program that is um, checking usernames and passwords to see if they're valid. This is the logging program for a computer. Um, so it's saying, OK, so this user has this password. This user has this password. I've given been given this username and password combination, does it match anything I have in the database? If so, huzzah, you're logged in, go ahead, do your stuff. 
If not, well, no. Sorry, I'm not gonna let you in. You also have um, a compiler. So the idea is, is that we typically don't write programs in something that the machine can interpret directly because that is very low level typically, very low level information and um, writing in uh, what's usually termed machine code is not fun. I'll, essentially, if you want to think of it this way, um, while writing a piece of, let's say a word processor is probably something on the order of, I don't know, a simple one is 500,000 lines of, of code. If you were to write that in machine code, you would probably end up writing something more on the order of seven to eight million numbers, which is really hard to interpret, really hard to follow, and so you pretty much don't do it. So what you have instead is you have high-level languages, as they're called, which are then converted into machine code. Because there's, when you take a list of instructions, um, fundamentally computers just read off lists of instructions and follow them. So you can specify the instructions in something the computer understands directly, or instead you can specify them in a more sort of verbose, easier to understand language, and then have the computer itself actually do the direct translation into the machine code for you so that you don't have to deal with all those low level details and you can just write in a higher level thing. Um, so what we have is we have this authentication program. The authentication program is modified initially so that instead of um, accepting only the usernames and passwords that are in its database, if you enter in a special password, it will also accept that as correct. That's the back door. Now, of course, this backdoor is kind of obvious because as soon as you look at the code, you go, okay, well, it's checking to see if it's in the database, and then if it's not in the database, it checks to see if the password is foo. Well, if the password is foo, then we log in. And what, like, it's pretty obvious when you look at the source code that there is a backdoor there. Of course, you have to be looking at the source code in the first place, so there is that aspect, but whatever. The idea is to get a better backdoor here than just something that is if password equals foo, then go ahead and let that user in. So instead of modifying the logging program directly, what happens, or what happened was Thompson modified the compiler. So it went, okay, let's see, am I compiling this authentication program? If it happens to notice it's compiling the authentication program, it goes, okay, I'm going to insert this little bit of extra code in here so that now when I see that I'm ex compiling the authentication program down to something the com computer can actually understand, Let's make it so that it will also accept foo as a password. Which is kind of neat, because now your original authentication program source code is untouched. It's perfectly clean. But the compiler, which you usually are not going to be looking at, has this, inserts this backdoor into there for you. So when the compiler compiles the authentication program, you get the same result as if you had inserted that extra bit of code in yourself. Now, this is not enough for Thompson. He was even more clever than this, and this is absolutely amazing. What he did was he went, okay, well, we don't want to have this backdoor inserting code lying about in the compiler, because then someone can look at the compiler and go, hey, well, you know, we've got this th bit of code here that seems to be inserting a backdoor. No, that's too obvious. So what he did is he went, okay, let's see if we can make the compiler detect when it's compiling the compiler. This is, a, this is a, a weird thing about computer, scientists, uh, about computer science, and in particular about compilers, is compilers are typically written in the language they compile. So you have this translation from a high-level language into machine code, and in order to achieve this translation, you need to already have, a, a, in order to make the program that does this translation, you need to already have something that does the translation. And so it's this weird cyclic dependency. In order to do this, you already have to have something that does it. Um, so what happens is there's a process called bootstrapping, um, which is to say you just assume that someone has written a really stupid translator already that does whatever, and then now you can do this process of having the compiler compile itself. But the idea behind Thompson's backdoor is essentially the compiler detects when it's compiling itself. If it notices it's compiling itself, then it inserts the piece of code that would detect when it's compiling the authentication program. Which is weird. But essentially what you end up with is you end up with a compiler that when you look at its source code has no backdoor in it. When you look at the login program, the authentication program, it has no backdoor in it. But when you do the actual compilation, a backdoor gets inserted. And when you recompile the compiler, 
which has this clean source, the backdoor inserter will actually get inserted. So <laughs> there's, there's actually a little bit more to it than that, but let's move on to something that's a little bit simpler. <laughs> so are there any simpler backdoors? And the answer is yes. Back in 2003, these two lines of code, which is a, this is a quick challenge for anyone who knows um, the C programming language, appeared in the Linux kernel under mysterious circumstances in the sense that it appeared in one branch but not the other and no one could figure out where they actually appeared from in the first place. There was no author, there was nothing. These two lines just appeared. So it's not really known how that was achieved in the first place, but the actual correct version of what the, um, so there was, a, there was a message that says this is checking for a particular case and is handling an error appropriately. So the actual correct version of this piece of code that does what the message said it was supposed to has two equal signs. The original one has one equal sign. So this is, this is a challenge to anyone who knows C, but the idea is what this ends up doing is instead of doing a simple error check and says, okay, well, if some weird conditions are met, then, well, we're going to return some error value back to the original color. Instead, what it ends up doing is it ends up actually mo doing a modification. You see, a double equals like this is, an, is a check. It says, or it checks to see if two things are the same. A single equals is an assignment. So this one is checking to see if this value is zero. The top one is assigning that value to zero, which does something that's interesting. Um, but what it ends up doing is a privilege escalation attack. It ends up turning the user that executes this code from a regular user into an administrator user. So this is, in comparison to Thompson's backdoor, this is incredibly simple. This is also something that um, relies on a totally different technique of being undetected. Thompson's attack does all these cyclic dependencies and backflips to get itself into a situation where it can't be detected because when you look at it, it's not there. This attack relies on you not noticing the fact that there's only a single equal sign. So it's hiding in plain sight as opposed to hiding behind smoke and mirrors. But both of these attacks have, have required sort of access to the computer. In the first one, it was, it's modifying the procedure when you type in your username and password. In this one, you're, you already are running some program on the computer and it's doing some stuff. So let's look at maybe an attack that doesn't actually require direct access to the computer. So in March 2014, it came to light, a bunch of people discovered that on Samsung uh, smartphones, um, particular ones, those with a particular type of processor, whatever, um, there was a backdoor or something that looked very much like a backdoor in the sense that anyone who is sitting on the other end of a cellular link, so anyone operating a cell tower, for example, could read and write pretty much arbitrary files on any uh, Samsung smartphone attached to the network, which is kind of scary when you think about it for a couple of seconds because that means contacts, that means emails, that means application settings, that means basically anything on a Samsung smartphone. And that's, that's actually really scary. But the real question is, is, was this actually a backdoor? Was this just a piece of sloppy coding or was it something that was maliciously or del deliberately inserted? So the answer is, is we don't know if it was deliberate. There's been nothing showing that it is, nothing showing that it isn't. So it's best probably to assume that it was not because the, um, the, actual, the actual sequence of events that led to this being discovered and actually um, exploited are extremely convoluted to the point where it's very, very unlikely that this actually was a backdoor. Nonetheless, it's still very scary. And what's even scarier about it is that the Snowden document detail something that's almost identical in approach. So it's, <laughs> it's a little bit uh, weird in that sense because we don't really, there's no proof that it is a backdoor, but it's still scary enough um, that we should really be treating it with the same sort of levity as if it was a backdoor because it can be exploited as if it was a backdoor. So <clears throat> we can talk about um, backdoors in software. We can also talk about backdoors in hardware. Because so far, everything I've talked about is sort of the, the software side of the computer system. So I'm not going to go into the details of this attack um, for time purposes. 
Um, but the idea is, is you essentially have a piece of hardware on modern Intel processors um, that speeds up the process of generating random numbers significantly. It's, I, I say 30 times faster, but it's actually significantly more than 30 times faster. Um, but it's, it's closer to about three, four orders of magnitude, so more like 10,000 times faster. It's guaranteed to be at least 30 times faster, but in like average case, most of the time, it's more like 10,000 times faster. So the idea is that you have this piece of hardware that generates random numbers, and there's a certain amount of entropy, randomness, to this sequence of random numbers. It's, this is getting a little bit information theoretic, I apologize, but the idea is, is essentially what, you, um, what the hardware manufacturer can do when they're, manu when they're actually making one of these ch Intel chips, they can make a very, very small modification to the chip that turns the sequence of random numbers from something that looks random, or something that is random, as best we can tell, into something that they can easily um, check, and something that they can easily predict, which is scary. It may not seem like it at first, but random numbers are an extremely important cornerstone of modern cryptography. So if you're doing any, dealing with anything relating to secrets that you're using encryption for, and you happen to use um, a compromised random number generator for that, it essentially compromises the entire encryption scheme. Um, so that's really quite frightening. Uh, so the, the moral of the story is don't trust hardware random number generators. But in particular, um, what it's more doing is it's showing that we, we have to worry about things more than just software. We also have to worry about hardware. And in particular, the modification, sorry, I skipped ahead two slides accidentally, but whatever. The modification that's made to the hardware is subtle enough that you cannot detect it with an electron microscope. You cannot tell the difference between the original hardware and the modified hardware, which is scary. And what's more is it could have been inserted by anyone along the supply chain. It could have been inserted by the original designers of the chip. It could have been inserted by the fabbers of the chip. It could have been inserted by several different parties. And so you're not only now trusting the original person, who, i.e. Intel, who made the chip, you're also trusting their fabs. And you're also trusting the people that carry the designs from the, from the original engineers to the fabs you're trusting a significantly larger amount of people now. And so this is starting to you know, really grow in scope. And we can even go further down along the supply chain than that. Um, I'm gonna pick on the NSA again because they're such a lovely juicy target. Um, and it, again, for the last sort of five, six years or so, they've been intercepting um, shipments of um, networking hardware to various locations, in particular, for example, Syria. So uh, a couple people might remember the 2012 internet blackout in Syria that happened during the civil unrest there at the time, um, and how it was thought that it was a move done by the Syrian government to you know, restrict access to social media platforms and other things that were being used um, to organize protests. It turns out it was actually, uh, the, the blackout was actually an NSA mistake they had backdoored the router, the main internet backbone in Syria. And while they were trying to erase their tracks to get um, basically unbackdoor the system so that their meddling could not be detected, they made a mistake essentially and brought down the entire uh, system. <laughs> so whether or not it was genuinely a mistake is still you know, up for debate, but Nonetheless, um, it was not actually the Syrian government directly. They may have known about the backdoor and asked the US government, but whatever. It's easier for them to just walk up and unplug it than it is for them to go through this entire rigmarole. Um, we can, of course, also introduce backdoors into existing systems. Um, if you have modification access to computer software, you can, of course, modify it so it has a backdoor. Um, but this isn't a terribly interesting thing because this is akin to saying, oh, well, we can modify the rules of the system. So we can make the system do things what couldn't do before. I mean, this is not really a particularly interesting um, direction of attack. But something that is interesting is we can modify and um, we can also look at backdoors in specifications for things. So this is essentially the entire premise of something called the skipjack cipher. 
where, so typically when you have a cipher, what you have is you have some message, it gets passed in through some black box to produce an encrypted version of it. There's another black box that you pass the encrypted version through in order to get the original message back. There's typically some key, some secret value that you plug into these black boxes um, so that you know, the information, so you have, to, you have to have this secret, basically shared value in order to um, be able to decrypt the encrypted version. So the idea of the skipjack cipher was, let's give the NSA all the keys, which is kind of a rather blatant attempt at being able to wiretap all communications, but whatever. That is, um, shall we say, a very annoying phase in uh, cryptography history where basically everything was classified and the only thing that was available for actual public use was known to already be flawed, severely flawed. It's a very interesting period of history if anyone is interested in the interactions between mathematicians and government. Um, but anyway, a more interesting um, idea in terms of specification is uh, something called the dual EC DRBC, DRBG random number generator which no one really cares about the name, but whatever. The idea of this is essentially, um, it's a num random number generator that again, generates extremely bad random numbers. It was in use for five or several years. I think it was like three or four years. A couple of academics came up and said, hey, this is really not that great. Um, there's a whole bunch of biases in the random numbers it generates and we really shouldn't be using this. And RSA, who is generally considered to be sort of the gold standard um, as far as cryptography companies go, said, oh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Um, and it turns out there's actually a backdoor in the random number generator. And yes, there's a lot of evidence that says that they were paid a significant amount of money to recommend it. So <laughs> there's a lot of um, problems with <coughs> cryptography standards being weakened um, by influences in government and also in private sector, which is surprising. But what's more interesting is can we actually do anything about these, uh, these security flaws, these backdoors in general? And so this is the point where I was putting together this talk and I was going, okay, well, I'm gonna try to do a talk on something other than my research area. And so I'm going to maybe learn a little bit more about uh, a slightly different area. And then I got to this part and I'm like, you know what, this is exactly what I'm doing for my research. So it snuck up on me, which, oh well. So what we can do is if we think we have a backdoor in one system, we can go, okay, well, let's introduce a second system that watches the first system and s checks what it's doing and is, it, is what it's doing actually kosher? Is it behaving according to a model of what we would expect it to? And the problem with this is, of course, now you have a second system, you also have to model the behavior of the first system, and you know, it's, it's really expensive and really frustrating to try and do this. So it would be nice if we could at least get rid of the cost aspect in, in terms of cost, I also mean efficiency and energy efficiency because now you're running multiple systems to do the job of one and things like this. So let's see if we can get it down to just a single system. And this is something, um, th this is where I realized that it was actually my research. Um, the idea is we can basically uh, restrict what a program is doing. Anytime it does something other than a very core set of like, for example, arithmetic, uh, we can say, is this something that is good? Is this something that we think is okay? Is this operation going to lead to any problems in the future? Um, now the issues with this is that it's usually focused on a particular type of behavior. For example, um, one of the projects in my lab at the moment is working on um, and basically a system that checks to see if web applications are leaking information to third parties. So is this, for example, email application actually only communicating with the email provider or is it leaking information to some somewhere else? which would be nice, um, but again, one of the other problems is that it's often, occur often done with sort of heuristics as opposed to strong guarantees. So things that are very good indicators, but not necessarily guarantees. So can we actually do anything better than that? And the answer is yes, we can. The only problem is that it's, it takes a very, very, very long time to write these software systems um, to the point where we've only managed to just barely get it down to something like 20 times overhead. So what would once have been a one week project now turns into a half year. So this is not really a good thing. The resulting software system is extremely good in the sense that um, there was a paper that was actually just published um, 
about a month ago now, six weeks ago, um, where they essentially went, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to prove that this system never crashes. And they did. They came up with an entire software system that, barring hardware errors, will never crash. And it's actually fully functional. And this is really strange when you think about it, because when was the last time something on your computer crashed? I'm going to guess it's probably not that long ago. Um, so <laughs> so the, the problem with this, of course, is that you're building a model. You're saying this program will never crash. Well, what does it mean for a program to crash? Probably, like, there's a whole bunch of technical descriptions I can give you, but the fundamental problem is that there are a lot of ways a program can crash, and you have to say, this program will never do X, this program will never do Y, this program will never do Z. And if you're doing a laundry list like that, it's entirely possible you miss one. And so now you've put the onus of, does this, are there, are there any flaws with this program from the implementation onto the specification? And the specification for what the program is supposed to be doing is just as complicated as the program, usually. So this seems like it isn't really solving much in the first place. Um, and another problem is, what if the piece of software that's saying this program meets this model is actually flawed itself? So then you can say, well, what happens if we prove the piece of software that's making these proofs is correct? And you end up with this same cyclic dependency thing again. Um, so these are issues that we have to deal with. And there are, they are things that we are working on in the systems community. Um, and they are... I think very fascinating areas and you should all come to systems and help me work on this because it's fascinating. But, you know. So what have we done? We've basically talked about uh, computer security, what it is, um, and sort of a general overview of a couple of uh, different flaws and why flaws are important. Just gone over a couple of backdoors and why they're important, how they work, and talked a little bit, very briefly, about some countermeasures uh, for these flaws and what it is they're doing. And with that, I'm done. Are there any questions that I can try to answer?